So, I built this neck. And you might notice that it doesn't have a heel or a transition to a heel. It's simply just the profile of the neck going all the way from the headstock to the very end. Now, I was super inspired by Ken Parker. If you've ever seen his archtop necks, they look just like this. And the first time I ever laid eyes on Ken Parker's neck, a thought occurred to me. That's the way a neck should look. It was elegant, it was minimal, it was sleek, it didn't have that heel. So you have to start questioning then, what's the point of the heel? Why is it there? Who was the first person to put that heel there? And those answers are really obvious, right? But there is something that we do need to consider, and that is that today's modern glues have a much stronger tinsel strength than the glues of the past. And therefore, we only need a small footprint to adhere those two surfaces together. And I've explored this a little bit. My last build, which was the Touch Capacitive Super Strat, that was a set neck, and the footprint for the neck heel and the body was tiny. And I'm just using Type Bond 2. We can get away with that these days. We can get away with interesting designs. We don't have to use that Morris and Tenon type joint anymore because of modern glues. And again, there's nothing wrong with those old joints. They're awesome. But if we wanted to explore something different and new, we can. And that's what I'm doing here. And I always want to do something new, whether that's optimizing a process or just trying something different. This might fail. Everything might fail. Who cares? This is what I decided on. A neck heavily inspired by Ken Parker's. The profile just goes from the headstock all the way to the end. There's no heel or transition. And as a result, I had two options, right? I could stick this neck onto this body two ways. I could actually have it float above the body, much like Ken Parker's arch tops. However, that presents a couple of problems downstream, right? If I have the neck floating over a, ne over a body without a actual pocket, then the pickup has to be raised and the bridge has to be raised. And I didn't want to do that. So all I did was make this concave neck pocket. So it is the exact negative shape of what the profile is on that heel. We have modern glues available to us and we don't need a huge surface area. And I could have done that. I could have just glued this without these rods onto this neck pocket. But because it's curved, when you seat it in that curved neck pocket, you can, it can basically roll on the axis to some degree. This particular neck has this kind of interesting shape here past the last 20 second fret. And that shape is mirrored in the pocket. So it makes sort of like a key, right? You can seat it in there and it, it won't tilt on its axis. But with clamping pressure and all that stuff, you, you can never tell what's gonna happen, right? It, it could shift. So I decided to use these carbon fiber rods. And I could have only used one. I'm thinking of more like indexing rods than structural rods, right? But they're serving both purposes. Um, the primary purpose is to keep it indexed so I know exactly where it goes and it doesn't kind of move around. But they're carbon fiber, they're light, they're very, very strong, and they're gonna also serve as uh, structural rods. So this seat's in here, just like that. And there's the concave neck pocket with the neck. It's something different, right? Keep in mind, this is a travel guitar, it's a short scale. There's not gonna be a whole bunch of tension on here. It's headless, so it's all gonna work out. And if it doesn't, whatever. Oh, let's weigh the neck. So the only thing that's missing from this neck is the hardware for the headless um, string clamps. Um, but right now, with the D-tube, the carbon fiber, structural neck rods, the frets, and all this tape, Okay, 296 grams. 
that's 10.55 ounces. So very lightweight neck. I'm very happy about the weight on this little guy. Sue, just a quick little note of how we got to this point, right? Obviously the fret job's done. These are the Jeskar EVO gold frets, so they're not as hard as stainless steel, but they're harder than nickel. I love them. They're gold, so they get that kind of cool look that goes really well with certain woods. And I did the fret job, did the polish, and with the high polish that I do, they don't look gold anymore. I think maybe with some more oxidation, they might get gold, but they're slightly gold now. So really cool frets, I dig them. And also I did a pre-finish, which you haven't seen yet. So the pre-finish I put on before fretting, there's a reason. You have worked with frets before and you tape off the board, right? And you know that this metal dust that's created when you're you know, working on your frets, if that any of that dust gets into your pale wood, it's, it's in there forever pretty much. It's like a stain and you can't get it out. And so I always like to do a, a quick pre-finish, even if it's just like a single coat of something, whatever, it really helps keep that metal dust from getting in there. And it's not just metal dust, right? We're also talking about all sorts of things that we do on the board, right? We put permanent marker and we are putting a sticky tape on there and we're doing all sorts of crazy stuff. You know, we're polishing with uh, all sorts of compounds. So I like to protect the fretboard and I also like the idea of a little bit of that finish getting into the slots. Just, you know, it gets those fret tangs in there and a little bit tighter. All right, so let's take a look to see how we got to this point. And then let's go ahead and start gluing this in. All right, so I'm at the fretting process for the travel guitar neck, and I've already documented my data-driven fret leveling process in the other bit, and I'll go ahead and link to that in the description. So essentially what I'm doing here, just to do a quick overview, is we want data before we just start leveling the whole board, right? Because that's typically what you're taught to do. You use your black marker, color the frets, and then just level the whole thing. But what we want to do is we want to have data before we start to erase all that data. So I use two colors, right? High frets get red or high spots get red and uh, I want to call them just regular spots, not low spots get black, right? So these are the parts that are rocking on the fretboard and you can see in this case here, it's just a tiny little bit of red here. That's the only spot it's rocking. And then here as well, just a tiny little spot where it's rocking, right? So the rest of the fret is great. So there's no point and leveling out anything that's black, we can maintain the original crown. So instead of leveling the whole board and having to re-crown every single fret, all we're doing is spot leveling. So we're leveling the section here in red and then only crowning that, and so it's less work. And also, we have this visual data. 
And if you wanted to, you can even create a spreadsheet, right? So every NIC you build, you can kind of capture which frets are high and low to see if there's any patterns occurring. Maybe there's something wrong in your process upstream. And that's it, I'll go ahead and link to the whole actual video so you can watch that. But in this case, I'm just gonna go through this. I've already documented this before. I actually ordered some carbon fiber rods from an actual carbon fiber manufacturer. And they were really pricey. And I was able to get this really cool one. It's white carbon fiber. You can't really get this too many places and it's marbled. It's really hard to see that detail, but it's really, really beautiful. And so I, I bought this as an option. These are fabulous. Look at the figuring on that carbon fiber. Um, and these are hollow too. Very, very stiff and sturdy for rods. I got a couple of different sizes. And these are the real deal. This is real deal carbon fiber from a carbon fiber manufacturer. And again, they're quite pricey. But I wanted to see if I could find a cheap alternative. So in an effort to find something that was less expensive, I went on Amazon. And it turns out there's a camera company that makes camera accessories called Small Rig. And they actually make these carbon fiber rods for rails for cameras. And these are real deal carbon fiber and they're just really affordable. St so stiff. I mean, these things are stiff. So these are what I'm gonna use. So the first thing we're gonna do is cut these to size and then epoxy them into the neck. And once that is done, we'll then glue the whole thing into the body.
So the neck is now on the body. It's been epoxied on and everything is just awesome. So it's sunken in. You really see that round profile, that C shape all the way to the end, kind of sinking into the wood. And it looks really cool. Just looks really nice. I'm going to install this CTS pot and then we'll do the rest of the wiring when that jack comes in. So the next thing we're gonna do now is we're gonna install the Nova headpiece or the locking strings here. And then once that's done, we will draw a line here for the 24 inch scale length. I'll probably push it back about an eighth of an inch. And then we will mock up with a low and high E string to determine the placement of where that bridge needs to be. So we're gonna be using the Nova hardware for this build. And Nova is a company out of Brazil. So I already opened this piece because I needed to take measurements for the actual uh, pocket that's gonna be put in. So this is super lightweight aluminum. And then here is the bridge. So let's open this up. So awesome. So I'm really leaning towards using these base plates now. I just feel like the base plates add more mass and everything just sounds better to my ears as opposed to the individual uh, single saddles, which I still use in a lot of builds, but if I can go with the base plate, I'll do that. Really looking forward to putting this on. All right, so here is the headpiece and I've already made this pocket that's about two millimeters deep. That's gonna allow this to sit in there very nicely. So the first thing we're gonna do is drill in the mounting screws and mount this little guy. So it'll look something like this. <laughs> so I had made the pocket here to get your fingers under for the tuners. So that's really cool. And again, if we have that base plate, it's gonna offer a lot more mass. And look at that, that's gonna look killer. So the cool thing about this design is that you don't have to put the pocket in. This is a 24 inch scale. So if you wanted to make it like a little bit longer scale, you could push it back and they can hang off. But in this case, this is 24 inch scale. So I think it lands somewhere around here. I'm not sure exactly where. All right, let's get the locking nut headpiece on. So this is just a quick sneak peek. I don't have the proper string gauges. I'm expecting those soon. I swear there's like a E here on the, where the H is supposed to be and an A where the E is supposed to be. This is just a quick mock-up, just so you get an idea of um, what this looks like. So let's take a quick little look here. 
This is that low profile knob that I was designing. And the idea is it's oversized. I can't remember what the dimensions are of this knob, but you can turn it, but you're not really meant to. This is supposed to be full blast all the way. The neck joint came out very lovely. You can tell that it looks like a neck profile sunken into a body. It looks different. That curve continues down. It's not a straight um, plane like an, a normal neck pocket. The roasted bird's eye maple fretboard is fabulous. And you really can't tell on screen, on camera. It's just not picking it up right. It's gorgeous in person, and I just can't get a good shot of it. These are the Jeskar EVO gold frets, so they're starting to look a little bit more gold since after I polished them. I love this neck. It looks so good. It looks so, so, so good. Beautiful satin feel. It's got a beautiful sheen to it. And that's just the true oil. I literally put maybe four or five coats of true oil on there. There's a trick to true oil. You only want to use it once. So get the small three ounce bottle, use it for your build and then throw it away. I think the first time I ever used true oil, I fell in love with it and then fell out of love with it for the next build. And that's because something goes bad in it after a amount of time. I don't know what it does. Maybe it catalyzes, I have no clue. I just know that I use it again and I just didn't find the same results. But new bottles, that's what I'm gonna start doing. Brand new three ounce little bottles, use them on the build, throw it away after that. Back of the guitar also has true oil and it is beautiful. I love true oil because it's so easy to use, it gives you great results, but it doesn't offer much in terms of protection from dents and dings. I usually will use a nitro, which is also very soft, but much, much harder than just an oil-based finish. So I am using acrylic for the cavity cover, and I'm doing this for a number of reasons. Just one, because I have it on hand. Two, I'm too lazy to cut the aluminum, even though I have that on hand. Two, I want to finish this build pretty fast because it's, I need to start doing other things. So the quickest way for me to build a control cavity is with the acrylic sheet that I have already sort of mounted onto a um, sort of like a wasteboard that I can take on and off my CNC. And it cuts super fast. So I can run the machine very fast. And this comes out in literally like a minute. <laughs> so it's totally um, worth my time to build it using acrylic. And it, I stopped using wood because wood will twist and warp and shrink and whatnot. And I think wood is the worst thing you can use for a control cavity, even though I think they look beautiful. Yes, they do. I've done it before. And I'm using uh, M2 and M3 hardware with the threaded brass inserts. And now I'm starting just to engrave them just for fun, because I can. And they just say designed and built by Mark Gutierrez, that's me. And they have the year uh, that I built it, 2022. And I put a quote on, since this is the travel guitar, I put a quote from Jack Kerouac's On the Road novel, and it just says, nothing behind me, everything ahead of me, as is ever so on the road. So I thought it was a, Pretty apt quote to put on the travel guitar. Obviously, I don't have the proper string gauges on or even the proper strings in their place. It's just a mock-up. And that's coming through my tiny itty bitty little test amp right there. So I'm pretty happy with this. It's adorable, it's cute, it's different. It looks really cool. Some really interesting design choices and build choices. It's just a sneak peek, like I said. I'm going to take my time in actually setting this up. It's not set up, by the way. <laughs> so this nut, like I mentioned, isn't even the right nut. So this is really high right now. When I get the nut in, I will cut the nut slots and then do a proper setup on it. Then kind of tear it down and just start polishing it because it needs to be polished. And, you know, I've got my grubby fingers all over it. Um, 
And then after polishing it, actually put a proper set of strings on. Um, and then we'll do a demo. So I'm going to record a song of this in a mix like I normally do. So I always like to show you what these sound like in a mix, like in context. So I'll record a full track demo and then probably the next time you see this, it'll be final setup with a nut and then a demo and with a lot of really great photos. So that's all we have for this week on the travel guitar. We've made a lot of progress. I think that by next week I should have full assembly complete. Setup is going to take a little bit longer. I'm using that D-tube and I just have zero knowledge of how much the string pull is going to be affecting that D-tube. So setup might be interesting. Well, that's all I have. Thanks for watching and take it easy.